We'll be getting started in a moment. Please take a seat. Good afternoon, everyone. What a gorgeous day in Burlington, Vermont. My name is Rick Page. I'm Dean of the Larner College of Medicine, and I'm really excited to welcome you to the annual Celebration of Excellence in Research Alumni Award presentation and lecture. Um, this is an exciting full week we have where we collectively celebrate the research of alumni, faculty, trainees, and students here at the Larner College of Medicine. This is the eighth year we've hosted an annual showcase that recognizes the exceptional body of work in research done by members of our Larner community. After today, there's more to come. I hope you'll join us tomorrow in the afternoon for our second annual research rally, a TED-style talk presentation that's really fun and there's a lot of energy as people really share the excitement they have about the research that they are undertaking. And, and I'm, I can't wait for the second rendition of this. Um, on Thursday, Dr. Uh, Tracy will provide a state of the, of the uh, research in the Larner College of Medicine. <clears throat> and we will be providing our uh, <clears throat> research awards. Um, and that will be followed by a reception back here in the Hale Gallery. And the week culminates with our signature Stetson lecture, followed later with a discussion about UVM's startup incubator and partnership with Cambridge-based BioLabs. And both the Stetson lecture and the discussion panel that we'll be having afterwards feature BioLabs founder and CEO, Dr. Johan Fruhoff. Uh, so it's a special week. This is our opportunity to acknowledge recognize and celebrate the research activities of our students, junior faculty, senior faculty, trainees, um, medical and graduate students. And we really hope this inspires uh, those who witness these events to further collaboration, cooperation, and innovation as we move forward in terms of our research mission. I now have the opportunity to introduce Dean Kate Tracy, many of you know her now. She's Senior Associate Dean for Research at the Larner College of Medicine, and with whom um, I, I've had a wonderful working relationship and has, has really served as a wonderful leader in our college. Uh, since February of 23, uh, Dr. Tracy has served as Senior Associate Dean and also as Director of uh, Research for the UVM Health Network. She joined us from the University of Maryland, where uh, in the School of Medicine, she was professor of epidemiology and public health, vice chair for research services, epidemiology and public health, and head of the division of preventive medicine. Dean Tracy also held numerous leadership roles at the University of Maryland, including their medical school, clinical and translational research informatics center, taking a lead of that, and was a special advisor to the Chancellor of the University of Maryland system during the COVID-19 response. She's been a key member of our leadership team and her background in multidisciplinary science and leading teams has been critical for the growth and sustenance of our research, research operations here at UVM Larner College of Medicine. I'd also like to note that she reimagined Research Week so this full week of activities is really, really her brainchild. And, um, and it's been tremendously successful. Uh, I encourage you to, uh, to come and participate uh, in as many of the events this week as possible. And uh, now I get to introduce her and she's gonna give a proper introduction to our very special speaker today. So now please join me in welcoming uh, Dean Kate Tracy. Thank you, Dean Page, for that wonderful introduction. It is now my distinct honor to talk about today's award winner, Dr. Jen Musa, and share some highlights of the impact of her work, both here and abroad. Dr. Musa received a BA in biology and psychology from SUNY Oswego in 1990 and a PhD in anatomy and neurobiology from the University of Vermont in 1994. While at UVM, Dr. Musa learned and worked in the laboratory of Dr. Rodney Parsons, and after leaving UVM, she did postdoctoral work at Cornell in the departments of biomedical science and molecular medicine, where she stayed on as a research associate. 
In 2001, Dr. Musa left Cornell to join the Department of Biology faculty at SUNY Broome Community College. There, Dr. Musa has taught anatomy and physiology to thousands of undergraduate students. And in 2009, she received the New York State Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching. How about a round of applause for that? That's a big deal. Very nice, very nice. She is most proud of the co-creation of Health for Haiti, SUNY Broome's first faculty-led credit-bearing global service learning course. Over the past 10 years, Dr. Musa has taken over 100 students to Haiti to engage in holistic projects. Health for Haiti has partnered with a rural community in Haiti to help provide sustainable access to clean and safe drinking water, nutrition, solar energy infrastructure, economic development, and high-quality education. Through countless outreach programs and presentations, Dr. Musa has raised significant funds for the Haitian community, including a commercial grade water filtration system, solar equipment, and engineering support to train Haitian workers. The projects have been life-changing for the people in Haiti, but are perhaps even more significant for the students who participate. Most recently, Dr. Musa earned an AAS in chemical dependency counseling, and in addition to her full-time faculty position, she serves as a substance use disorder clinician at the Addiction Center of Broome County. Another shout out for lifelong learning um, and doing that important work in, in the community. She's committed to sharing her love of neuroscience at the Addiction Center and created the popular Brain Academy, where she shares research about the neuroscience of addiction, sleep, stress, synaptic plasticity, and mental health with the hope of empowering individuals as they navigate the challenging path of recovery. Now it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Michael Upton, who will formally present Dr. Musa with this year's Alumni Award. Dr. Upton is a native Vermonter who received his BA at Dartmouth College and graduated from the Larner College of Medicine in 1994. Currently, he serves as a member of the psychiatric team at the UVM Counseling and Psychiatry Services. He is a member of the Foundation Leadership Council for the UVM Foundation, and on July 1st, became president of the Larner College of Medicine Alumni Executive Committee, which serves as the governing body of the Larner College of Medicine Alumni Association. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Upton. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dean Page and Senior Associate Dean Tracy. It's a pleasure to be here as president of the Larner College of Medicine Execu Alumni Executive Committee. And on behalf of the Executive Committee, it's my honor to recognize Dr. Jennifer Musa, PhD, class of 1994. And for those of you who weren't paying attention, we graduated in the same year with the Distinguished Graduate Alumni Award. This award is presented annually to an alumnus for the, from the Larner College of Medicine's PhD or Master of Science programs who has demonstrated outstanding achievement in basic clinical or applied research, education, industry, public service, humanitarian, humanitarianism, and or outstanding commitment to Larner College of Medicine community. Uh, and, service. I've read Dr. Farmer's book several times, and so I'm very excited about this because it seems to me the best way to apply all this hard work that all you researchers do is to figure out how it makes human life in the world better, and uh, service is part of that. So at this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Musa to step forward to receive her award and then speak on the science of service. Thank you so much. This is um, such a tremendous honor. I, I really appreciate it. I'm so excited to be here. I haven't been back at the University of Vermont for 30 years, so it's been a while. Um, and I do want to thank all of you for being here. I know how busy everyone's schedules are, so I appreciate you taking the time to attend my talk. So I'm excited to share a little bit with you about what I've been up to for the past 30 years. Um, I will tell you, if you were to talk to me 30 years ago, I would have told you that I was absolutely certain that I would be pursuing a career in academic research. Um, simply put, I absolutely loved it. I couldn't imagine myself doing anything else. And I had a wonderful experience here at UVM. 
Um, I was excited to move forward and to continue to build my skills and my experience. Um, but, you know, as often happens, there were some twists and turns. And so my career did not go exactly at high, as I had envisioned. So what I'd like to do today is tell you just a little bit about my path, tell you um, about a project I've been involved in for the last 10 years, my Health for Haiti course, and also show you that many of the characteristics and values of scientific research that I really learned about here at UVM have been an integral part of my work and my life since I left here. So if we start back in 1990 when I came, um, I had the great privilege and honor of working in Dr. Rod Parsons' lab. Um, Rod was an absolutely wonderful mentor. Uh, we worked with mud puppies. And I learned to be an electrophysiologist studying cell signaling and parasympathetic neurons. I had a wonderful committee um, who helped me along every step of the way. And it is so nice to see some of you here today. You had such an impact um, on my life. Wonderful members of Rod's lab and also my fellow classmates. Um, graduate school is not easy and it helps to have uh, a bunch of colleagues along with you um, through the journey. So after leaving UVM, I went on to Cornell University and I was there as a postdoc and as a research associate. I continued on learning new skills in electrophysiology, but also built my te techniques in biochemistry and molecular medicine. And I actually stayed there for about six years. But during that time, I had a lot of changes in my personal life, um, things again that I hadn't expected. I ended up moving back to the Binghamton area where my family was and I was commuting to uh, Cornell about an hour. And then at the time I left Cornell, I was, um, having my second child, Allie, who's here. Um, so my life had changed and my responsibilities had changed a little bit. And so I did some different kinds of work. I worked as a science writer for about 15 years. 10 of those years I worked for Cell Press and I wrote press releases for many of their journals. In this work, I got to stay involved in cutting ed re edge research, read new papers that were coming out, interview scientists. A highlight of that is twice I got to interview Dr. Eric Kandel, uh, who wrote my neuroscience textbook <laughs> that I used when I was here. Um, but it really helped me to build skills in translating really complex scientific information into something that non-scientists could understand. And I did continue that work for about 15 years. While I was on maternity leave um, from having Allie, I took a job as an adjunct at SUNY Broome Community College, our local community college. SUNY stands for State University of New York and Broome is the county that we live in. And I have to tell you that Dr. Chris Abadi, who nominated me for this award, who was one of my classmates, um, when I told him that I was receiving the award, he told me he could not promise me that his letter hadn't been auto-corrected from Broome to Brown. So now that you've given me the award, I think it's safe for me to let you know, I have not been working at Brown for the past 20 years. I've been at SUNY Broom. But um, a community college is a really special place. And I didn't really know that until I started working there. At a community college, you work with students that come from all different backgrounds. They're all different ages. Many of them have families and jobs. And many of them wouldn't have the opportunity to further their education if it wasn't for this affordable two-year option. So a community college is a really great place for many people to either further or start their education. While I've been there, I've primarily taught anatomy and physiology to undergraduate students, most of them in different health science careers, but I've also had the opportunity to be involved in some really special interdisciplinary travel courses. And so I'm gonna be telling you about one of those today. And also, as was mentioned, I went back to school a few years ago and I earned an associate's degree. Um, it is really an interesting thing to become a student at a place where you've taught for 20 years. So that can be a very humbling experience. Um, so I, I did complete my associate's degree. During that time, I took a sabbatical and became the oldest intern in the history of interns at the Addiction Center of Broome County. Um, but that was a wonderful experience and they hired me part-time. So I, I actually worked there for uh, five mornings a week. 
um, working with our outpatient rehab uh, patients. And as part of that job, as was mentioned, I've started Brain Academy. Brain Academy is um, really just kind of a celebration of neuroscience, and we talk about topics that are of interest to the clinicians and to the patients who attend. And I've had really remarkable feedback um, from the clients. For many of them, this is turning out to be like the first positive educational experience that they've had. There are seven sessions on all different topics, and who, the people who attend earn a certificate at the end when they've completed all seven sessions. And there is an incentive. Um, at the end of the sessions, um, you can have a brain cupcake. And I have to thank Allie for this. Allie makes these brain cupcakes. I don't know what I'm going to do when she moves out of the area to take her job because I'm not making those brain cupcakes, but... Um, they're they're very popular. So it's it's been a lot of fun. But what I'd really like to share with you today is the work that I've done as part of my Health for Haiti class. This is a class that I co-taught with a colleague who was the chair of dental hygiene um, for dental hygienist training at SUNY Broome. And this particular course involved taking students uh, to a developing country, which a lot of colleges maybe wouldn't agree to let you do that, where they would do 10 days of service work. And I want to show you how my scientific training and the values that have really been so important to me since I was a student here have really been a part of the work that I've done as part of Health for Haiti. So the first is definitely curiosity. A good scientist asks questions. A good scientist wants to learn new things. And this course is all about seeing a, a really different part of the world um, that most people don't get to see. And so as part of this course, students take the class, which is a four credit lab science. They pay tuition. They're involved in fundraisers, but all of the money they raise goes to the people in Haiti they pay all of their own travel expenses. And for our community college students, this is a tremendous sacrifice to be able to fund this travel and this trip. And many of these students, not only have they never traveled before, many of them had never been in an airport before. Um, so this was really a chance to expand their horizons and do a completely different type of learning. So if you don't know too much about Haiti, it shares the western one-third of the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean with a separate country, the Dominican Republic. It's not a very big country. I know I should have fit it in Vermont since we're in Vermont. Just fit it in New York State. Um, it's about 10,000 square miles, has about 11 and a half million people living in it. Um, and where we work, we, we fly into Port-au-Prince, Hi, my pointer won't work. And we travel up north to the area called Grand Saline. So we work in a very rural community in that Grand Saline area. Haiti is one of the most beautiful places that I've ever visited. They have the sea, they have mountains, they have lush greenery, unbelievably beautiful sunsets, and a tremendous amount of pride. Some people don't know that Haiti is the only country in modern history that was formed as a free republic after a successful slave revolt. And they're very proud of that, very proud of their independence. A lot of what we hear about Haiti in the news is negative, but I am here to tell you that there is a tremendous positive side to Haiti as well. In addition to being a beautiful place, it's also one of the poorest countries in the world. And it's a poverty that for those of us who were lucky enough to be raised in the United States, is really hard to even imagine. So this is a picture of a typical family home in Grand Saline where we work. There's five people who live in this house. There is no electricity, there is no running water, there is no sanitation, and most people lack adequate access to basic necessities, things like food, um, clean water to drink, access to healthcare and to education. So. It is very different than the world that most of us have experienced. When we started working in Grand Saline, this was the only building in the community. This is their church. It also served as a school for a handful of students. 
so there was a lot of things for us to work on. And we had students from all different backgrounds. And I'm gonna tell you about just a few of those projects that we've been working on for the past 10 years. So one thing that's important if you're gonna be a good scientist is communication. Um, communication is essential to work with members of your team, but also to be able to communicate with the larger community. In Haiti, they speak French Creole. And most of the students who traveled to Haiti didn't speak French Creole. So we had translators who worked with us. And we had such a blessing of having translators who were former SUNY Broom students, who were Haitian and back in Haiti or still SUNY Broom students and would travel with us to Haiti and work as translators. This was such a comfort to our students to work with these translators who they needed to do pretty much everything they were gonna do and have them be fellow students. So this was a really critical thing for our program. Also, that distance between Port-au-Prince and Grand Saline is only about 75 miles, but it takes us about four hours to travel that because of the conditions of the roads. And a lot of times we would get stuck in the mud, which we like to call Haitian snow, um, because we couldn't get our bus out and we'd end up having to walk. So again, very different world for our students. What we would do on the first day we arrived, and, and this sounds like we were doing it for the community, but we were actually doing it more for the students, is we would have a half day where they would pack up food in bags. Uh, they had raised money to make 500 bags of food, rice, beans, oil, things like that, that would feed a family for about two weeks. So this was really a gift to thank the community for welcoming us but it was also a chance for our students who are a little shell-shocked um, arriving here to get to work together and to kind of do some team building and sort of get acclimated to where we were. And so they would work together packing up the food. You also have to have tremendous communication with the community because you cannot show up in a developing country and hand stuff out. You have to have good infrastructure and you have to have good communication. And we did. We had wonderful events again with 500 families coming through one at a time. And it was a chance for our students to really have their first introduction and first communication with the community that they'd be serving over the next 10 days. Now, public health is also important. As a scientist, even if you're working in basic research, you usually care about health and health advocacy. Many of our students were health science students, and working under the supervision of a Haitian doctor, we would offer medical clinics. We would often see 150 patients in a day because these people did not have regular access to medical care. This was also a good for lesson for our students about working within the scope of your practice, right? So working again with the Haitian doctor, some students were early in their training, so they would just be taking vitals. Other students who were farther along could provide more assistance. We even had a Haitian or a pharmacy. All of the medications were bought with money that we fundraised. Um, and everything was bought with the Haitian doctor, again, in Haiti, so we weren't bringing medications into the country. But this was also a good lesson for our students about the right way to do this kind of work. We even had an optical center. I know these days I'm lost without my readers. If I have to look at anything up close, we can get those at the drugstore. Not the case for the people living in Grand Saline. So we would bring a bunch of readers um, and have an optical center where they could get fitted for some glasses. We also had dental hygiene students and they did amazing work. They would often see hundreds of children and they would use cutting edge techniques to not just do cleanings, but to do fluoride varnish and sealants in the field. Again, no running water, no electricity. Um, they did an amazing job and helped hundreds and hundreds of kids with their oral hygiene. They also did amazing health education as well. So this was a chance for our students to really use their skills in a meaningful way. I'm also a big fan of teaching critical thinking, something, something we sometimes don't have enough of. Um, and so we would plan lessons in critical thinking for the school and community in Grand Saline. And we wanted this to be sustainable. So what we would do is create these lessons 
teach them to the teachers and then let them have all the supplies so they could make that part of their curriculum. So one of my favorite lessons we did, and I will never forget this, was a lesson we did on magnification. This was a completely new concept for the people in Grand Saline. And we started with magnifying glasses and worked our way up to microscopes. And the way that we did this is we asked each teacher in the school to pick one student so that they could do the lesson together. This way, the teacher would learn the lesson, they would see how the student was responding, and again, then after we were gone, they'd be able to infuse this in their curriculum. I probably have too many pictures of this, but this was such a wonderful lesson to do. Um, these people had never even seen a magnifying glass before, so it was really exciting. And we also taught them about integrity of recording scientific data, um, so that was all part of the lesson as well. And we had battery powered microscopes that we left behind. We had brought some brine shrimp with us and seeing people look through the microscope at something swimming around, what just never gets old, right? Um, could not believe it, right? So we could do some really good lessons about health hygiene there as well. And since I'm an anatomy teacher, whenever we'd have old and worn out supplies, I would secretly collect them, right? And bring them to Haiti. Um, and so we did a lot of health education as well. And just like looking through a microscope, seeing somebody hear their heartbeat for the first time through a stethoscope was also really exciting. So another thing a scientist has to be good at is solving problems. And when we started working in Haiti, I was really overwhelmed by the need. Um, I didn't know where we could possibly start. And I had a lot of ideas, but I'm glad I made the decision to ask the community what they actually wanted. Um, and I was really surprised at the response. The community asked for computers. That was number one, right? Again, remember there's no electricity, okay, in this community, but they wanted computers. They wanted to connect to the rest of the world. And so we made that happen by being creative about energy. Um, we partnered with a solar company in Endicott where I live. Um, she trained our students and we did a solar installation. Um, so this is community college students who had never done this kind of work before installing solar panels on that church that I showed you the picture of. This is the first time that this community could have a meeting at night. Okay, they had no lights out there, it was very dark. And so this really transformed even the way the community could interact with each other. And then there was the computers. Um, so we had donated computers that had been refurbished and definitely the most popular thing that we had in the school. And it was so popular that we had to start offering classes for adults as well, they were complaining. Um, so to learn how to write a letter, save a file, fill out a job application, right? We had classes like that. And it didn't stop with computers. We also started a sewing school. So now we had solar powered sewing machines and could teach sewing classes with really talented sewing teachers doing master pattern making um, where students in school or adults could learn how to sew and they're making absolutely beautiful clothes. This has advanced to the point where students can earn a credential that can help them to get a job and the woman that you see in the middle panel, she now supports her entire family by making school uniforms. Um, so this has been a great economic initiative. We also are very passionate about teaching and learning. Again, I had such an incredible experience here um, and I've been a teacher for 20 years. So this is something that's been very important for Health for Haiti. As I said, when we started working in this community, there was only about 20 children attending school in the church. We have really invested in education and Haitians place a very high value on education. So we're about to start a new school term, October 2nd, and we're going to have 300 children in the school now. So it's grown dramatically. These are our teachers. We've also invested in professional development for teachers. And I'd like you to see that the way they're dressed, this was not for the picture. This is the way they dress to come to school. They're walking on dirt roads. They're teaching in classrooms that sometimes have sheet metal walls and dirt floors, but they take their job very seriously and they're very committed to providing quality education. We now have classes from kindergarten through ninth grade. Ninth grade is high school, just like it is here. So that's a big investment. We've also started having a kindergarten graduation and are able to follow the kids as they move through school. 
these kids often say that their graduation was the best day of their life. You know, they're like seven years old, so haven't had a lot of life yet, but it's still very nice to hear. And you know, supplies are a problem and these teachers are so creative. One teacher literally collected garbage and had a lesson where she wanted the students to make things. And the first little guy you see, he made a sandal out of cardboard and he said he would like to be a shoe designer. The little boy in the middle made a car. He would like to be a mechanic. And the boy on the other side made an actual working stove, again, out of garbage. Now, kids should not be having to use garbage um, for part of their lessons, but I'm just showing you how they are so resourceful in terms of really promoting education. And I just wanna highlight two of our students very briefly. This is Elena, and she wants to be a doctor. And Kendi, he wants to be an engineer. This is the future of Haiti. Okay, this is the Haiti that I know, these hardworking kids that don't have a lot of resources, but are incredibly committed to bettering their country. And again, our teachers are really remarkable, again, working in conditions that are not perfect. I don't have time to tell you all of their stories, but they all have a story. These are fellow humans who are doing their best walking long distances. These teachers have been with us through much of the past 10 years, um, and they are our best resource at the school. They're truly remarkable. We've also really focused on excellence in education, making this rural school a true center for excellence. So this is a real education that they're getting. We had about 100 students, and then over the past two years, as conditions deteriorated in Haiti, Many families fled the more urban areas for the safer countryside, and that's why our enrollment has swelled to 300, and you can see how um, crowded they are. This year, we were actually able to build two new classrooms that will be available for the students when school opens in a week or so, and those classrooms will now accommodate an additional 60 students. So we're really investing in this infrastructure. And just in case you're interested in seeing what a construction project looks like in Haiti, it's different than what we see in New York. Usually studies, or the US usually starts with a drawing. This is a drawing of what the community wanted for the new kindergarten, and usually starts with a rocky, empty piece of land. Everything is done by hand. We help to raise money to buy all the supplies in Haiti, all the labor in Haiti, thereby supporting the Haitian economy. And so here's the building almost finished. And here's the kindergartners on their first day. Apparently they were driving everybody crazy. Every time they walked by, they'd be like, when is it ready? When is it ready, right? Um, so they have a beautiful learning space and what a great way to support our littlest learners as they get started on their education journey. And I'm really proud of what has happened with our ninth graders. So in ninth grade in Haiti, you have to take a national exam, okay? And that exam requires you to travel to a testing site and go through three days of testing. We had our first class of ninth graders three years ago, and those students traveled. We had to rent a truck, stayed for three days to take the exams. Um, they did travel with the school cook, so they were traveling with a personal chef, which is very nice. Um, but this was the first time in 40 years that students from this part of Haiti had the opportunity to sit for the national exams. Last year, we had our largest group of ninth graders, 22 ninth graders. And I just found out two weeks ago, we had 100% pass rate on that exam, okay? So yeah, that's worth some applause. So you can see the quality of education that's being offered is really good education. So you can offer all the education you want, um, but one real issue that we fall into is that these kids don't eat every day. There is tremendous food insecurity in Haiti, and we had to come up with a way to work on this problem as well. Now, we are a community college course. I don't think it's possible or even appropriate for us to try to raise money to buy food for hundreds of kids. So we approach this from a different direction. 
We actually invested money in renting some land and buying some seeds. And so we created community gardens that the community comes out and works in. Haiti has much better weather than we do here on the East Coast, so you can grow things all year round. And they grow vegetables, they grow corn, they grow beans, they grow melons, right? All kinds of things. And this is not like a backyard garden. These are huge fields, okay? So they're able to grow a lot of food. They completely by hand reconfigure these fields to grow rice when it's the appropriate time. Um, rice is hard to grow. And then the community comes out to do the harvest. Again, no equipment. This is all done by hand. And so here you can see some of the community members helping with the rice. All of that food goes to providing a school lunch. So at least we know that our kids are getting one meal a day. Um, and I wanted you to see the cooking conditions. Can you imagine for cooking for hundreds of kids over an open fire like that in the heat? Um, but they do a tremendous job. And our kids are so proud of this. They often say we're the only school that has our own garden to feed us. Um, so this has been a very successful way to solve this problem. Prior to the pandemic, we tried to build a, well, we did, we built a school kitchen and we were hoping to improve the cooking conditions. But then with the pandemic and condi conditions deteriorating in Haiti, we kind of stalled on that project. But that ended up being kind of a good thing because after things really destabilized in Haiti, the farmers who live in this area were not able to travel to sell their rice. And this is how they support themselves. So we ended up buying all the local rice from the farmers because we had a place to store it in the kitchen. This keeps all of the money in the community because then now these people can pay some tuition for their kids to attend school. We even created jobs for people who weren't farmers to kind of manage and package the rice. And now that it's safely stored, we're able to um, sell it back to the community as needed. So that was a creative way to address that problem. So collaboration and teamwork is one of the most important things that you have to have if you're a scientist. And I'm gonna tell you now about what I think is our most important and most impactful project. This one would not have been possible without tremendous teamwork. So this is the Artibonite River. It's the biggest river in Haiti. It's the only source of water for the people who live in Grand Saline. And this water is really dirty water. It's contaminated with human waste, with animal waste, the doctor that we work with in Haiti once told me that in the United States, we would not let our pets drink this water. And this is the only water that's available to these people. And they were sick a lot from drinking this water. People even died from drinking this water. So after we went to Haiti in 2014, when we were working on this program, the father of one of our students happened to work at a water filtration company. And this company, the Paul Corporation in upstate New York, donated a municipal grade water filtration system for us to take to Haiti. It's a $60,000 piece of equipment and engineering support as well, okay? Um, we just had to get it there from Cortland out to Grand Saline. So the team in Cortland packed it up. We bought a shipping container um, that was gonna serve kind of as the house for the water filtration system um, and we shipped it. Um, I never expected I'd have the maritime shipping app on my phone, but I was following this container. And this was a big risk because we had no idea how we were gonna get this through customs in Haiti. Customs in Port-au-Prince, I had been told by many people, is a black hole, okay? We were expecting we may have to pay bribes. We were expecting that there could be really long delays. And that's where the collaboration came in. I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Paul Farmer. We lost him a couple years ago. If not, look him up. He is an incredible public health advocate. Dr. Farmer um, started the biggest charity in Haiti, which is called Zanmi Lasante, which is part of Partners in Health. One of my colleagues at Cornell was at Harvard at this time, and she knew Dr. Farmer, and she went into his office and said, my friend needs your help, right? And so Dr. Farmer emailed me and agreed to help us. While our ship, our container was on the ship, we donated everything in our container to Partners in Health. 
And so they took control over it. They got it through customs at no extra fee in two days, okay? And of all of this project, this part really feels like a miracle because that container, we shipped it in November. It arrived in Grand Saline in January, the same day our class landed in Port-au-Prince. And traveling with our class was three Paul engineers would have had nothing to do if that container was not here, okay? They lost a lot of sleep over that. Same day it got there. So the community helped unpack it. Um, it works by microfiltration. So if you could imagine that gray circle being like a pencil dot, okay? The filtration pores are 0.1 micrometer. So it filters out things that cause like giardia, cholera. We treat it with a little bit of um, chlorine to kill viruses. Okay, and our engineering students, SUNY Broom engineering students, work with engineers to get the system set up and to keep it functioning. It pumps water right out of the river, 22 gallons a minute. And so here you can see a SUNY Broom engineering student with an engineer from Paul uh, working on the system. This is the before and after. Okay, so this is the water people were drinking. That's the filtered water. This has transformed the health of this community. The people even look different than they looked 10 years ago. The system is run by three members of the community who work as operators. They receive a lot of love and support and professional development from the Paul Corporation, um, but they've been running the system for years. It's one of the busiest places in town, currently serves about 1,500 people with clean, safe drinking water. And in March of this year, we will celebrate 10 years of clean water in this community. It's not just for drinking. We also have taught about hand hygiene and set up some hand washing stations at the school. Also didn't expect a pandemic to come along, but this was a great thing for that. So I'm showing you a couple of kids getting water here. And just again, to make the point that it's been 10 years, these kids have had clean drinking water their entire lives, okay? So it's, it's a, a, a real change for the community. The system was run with gas generators, okay? Which was hard and gas is very expensive and actually became very dangerous to get. So our intention was to convert the system to solar power we designed and built a pavilion, and we were all ready to go, and that was in 2019, and then everything changed, right? We had the pandemic, we couldn't run our course, and then things just got so much worse in Haiti. And so this is where you become the scientist who's persistent and patient, and you don't give up, and you keep trying. And it took five years, okay, until... Uh, you can see how old and rusty the pavilion looks right now, but we never gave up. And in 2023, we were finally able to get a couple of companies in Port-au-Prince who are solar companies to come out to give us an estimate. We had to build a building to house the batteries and inverters. Um, this probably doesn't look like the most exciting picture, but it is. This is a truck loaded with about $20,000 of solar equipment that now is gonna have to travel over some of the most dangerous gang controlled roads in Haiti to make it to, to Grand Saline. Um, this was so secret, I didn't even know. I'm glad I didn't know the day it was going. But here's pictures, it made it, the technicians made it. Here's the solar installation on that pavilion that sat empty for so long, batteries and inverters. And here's my team in Haiti um, shaking hands in front of it. So now the system is completely run by solar power. We can run it for a longer time each day and serve even more people and have more water available. So also when you're a scientist, you have to have vision. Things don't always go the way that you expect it. I now found myself teaching a course that couldn't run because we can't travel to Haiti. It's too dangerous, um, not at all possible for us to get there. Okay, so how do you show up when you can't show up, right? You gotta find different ways to show up. And so our SUNY Broom engineering students have been working with the community to design a solar bakery. This bakery would provide the only bread in the area and would be a real economic initiative for the community. So this is just in its early stages. 
But we've also gotten creative and started partnering with the local Haitian community. Um, our students had a Haitian dinner where a local Haitian restaurant made all the food and we invited people from the Haitian community. We had a fantastic turnout. I have a meeting later this week to start planning the second of these events. Um, but this is a way to kind of continue that work even without being there. And then lastly, I want to say something about integrity and humility. Maybe some of the most important qualities that a scientist can have. And I want to share this Haitian quote with you, tout moon si moon. This means every person is a person. And this has really been at the core of what we've done as part of this project. Paul Farmer once said, the idea that some lives matter less than others is the root of what's wrong with the world. Why is it if you're born in a place where you don't have access to resources, you're not as important, right? Your needs are not as important. So this has been something that we've really worked on. You know, these are real people, right? Living their lives from the oldest members of the community who now are going into their later years not being sick with GI problems all the time. Parents who have told me, do you know what it's like to be able to give your baby water that you know is not gonna make it sick, right? So these are people's lives, they matter, and this is worth investing in. And it's not just my students. Again, we're a community college. Our entire community has been involved in this project. There are retirees who have refurbished computers, collected sewing supplies, um, I've spoken at many local elementary schools. That kitchen I showed you, that was built by a K through five school that did coins for the kitchen for an entire year, okay? Um, this little girl I'm showing you here was in fifth grade when I spoke to her school and she went out and had a bake sale after finding out about it and raised money for the kids in Haiti. That little girl just graduated from high school. I haven't heard from her since fifth grade. Um, she emailed me and said, I just graduated, I'm going off to college, I wanna do another bake sale. It's like, okay, great. She raised over $600 in her sale and that money is going towards desks and benches for the new classrooms. Um, so, you know, many people have contributed to this effort and I cannot say enough about the students. As a teacher, I've never been involved in a project that has had this much impact. Some of our students come home and change their majors. We have a student who just graduated with a master's in international social work from Columbia. We have students who have gone into public health, who have gone into medicine, and even students who have just gotten more involved in their local community as a result of participating in this process. There's also been such tremendous joy, right? Every person is a person. Sometimes you have to be across from somebody and interact with them to realize you actually have more in common, right? We share a common humanity. Um, and this is a lesson that our students have learned. This is a quote from a, a Health for Haiti student saying that the trip is the most amazing thing that they've ever done. They won't be the same person and it was a life-changing experience. These students were not the same people that got on the plane when they got back home. Again, it, it really does change you. It has certainly impacted my life. Um, this student got a tattoo that in Creole says, be grateful. He did not get the tattoo in Haiti. So I have to say that he, he did go back to Haiti a couple of times, but you can see what an impact that this has had on the students. So this idea of every person is a person, right, is such an important thing. And although a lot has changed since I've been here, I see your signs, I see it on your website, right? The same values that I learned when I was here are still so prominent. Things like integrity, accountability, compassion, altruism, social responsibility, right? Cultural humility, kindness, and respect. These are things that I learned while I was here. I've certainly take, tried to take them forward in my work with my students and with my community, both locally and globally. And I think they really should be the core of our efforts. So I want to say thanks, uh, first of all, to 
all of the people I worked with here at UVM, Rod, you were such a wonderful mentor and so patient. I really do try to channel you when I'm teaching a and um, But the members of my committee, you gave me just such an incredible start. My classmates, Dr. Chris Abadi, for nominating me um, for this award. I'm really grateful for that. I have to thank all of the people who donated to Health for Haiti, because make no mistake, all that stuff I showed you today would not have been possible if people hadn't been donating to these projects. Um, to all the mentors that I've had, Dr. Rick Ferenzi, who hired me at SUNY Broome and has had such an influence in my life, and certainly my family. A lot of my family members have worked in Haiti with me, have come there, certainly supported me. Uh, my parents, my sister, um, and my husband and my daughters, Olivia and Allie, have supported me and put up with a lot because I'm kind of busy. <laughs> um, so I really appreciate that. So I just want to leave you with um, two thoughts, which is actually maybe advice wrapped up in a thought. The first one is wherever you find yourself, even if it's not what you expected, you should just always do the best you can with what you have available to you. And if you keep those core values that you believe in close and you let them guide you, I promise you, you'll find yourself doing work that you're really proud of. And the other thing is, don't just pick the projects that you're certain are gonna turn out well. Instead, pick the projects where you're absolutely certain that no matter how it turns out, it was worth doing. Thank you. What a wonderful and inspiring journey you've been on. Um, we do have time for a few questions, so I want to open it up. I think Liz has online questions through Zoom and anybody in the audience? Nashville? Could have kept talking. You, you could have. Any on, uh, Rick? Thank you so much. Really. Yeah, please. Um, how, uh, how, how, do does your organization and others how are they managing right now with the at least the chaos that we're seeing i for years gave to food for the poor and one year our family it was amazing you could give a house goats and a life to a, to a family mm -hmm. for an amazingly reasonable amount of money and we all did that as a family and and our how are those organizations functioning in a in a, a situation where if you're sending resources like that will they be diverted yeah anybody who tells you that there's no risk of that has never worked in haiti i mean this is a risk you're absolutely right one of the things we've had going for us is we have zero overhead i mean all of the donations were through the college's foundation so we didn't have to pay any overhead, right? And we always let people know we're doing our best, but we cannot guarantee that something's not gonna happen. And, and I was explaining to Kate too, I don't even say the name of the village we work in. I use a very general term of a whole area because you have to be so careful about calling too much attention. It's hard to raise money when you have to be a little careful, right? For organizations like Food for the Poor, a lot of times they'll have enough infrastructure, but I know they haven't been working in this part of Haiti for a couple of years. For us, we have a joint bank account in Haiti at a Haitian bank, and we transfer money from New York to Haiti, but I could never guarantee you that something wouldn't happen. I trust my partners but I don't know about the bank, right? I, you know, when we have to purchase equipment. So there's always an element of risk associated with that. Relative to their neighbors, these people are very rich. 
And, and how do they deal with the fact that they have this, but they can't share it with everybody? Mm -hmm. And people who don't have these resources just would be jealous of them very easily. And they are. I mean, the, the Paul Corporation actually is giving us two more of those water filtration systems, you know, so we could put them along the road a mile or two down, right? Um, and, you know, just right now where we can't travel to Haiti, that's that's would be a difficult thing for us to do. Um, I guess I just keep reminding myself, I, I can't fix Haiti. I stay in my lane. I work with my community. That's why we had to build a wall around the water system. We have not lost a piece of equipment. We have not lost a computer because of what you're saying. The community protects these resources um, because they're not common there. Um, so, you know, I have never lived in Haiti. I'm not sure what that's like, but I trust them to, to do that part of it. And I try to really stay in my lane doing what I can do. I cannot fix Haiti. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that truly is incredibly inspirational. Um, and thank you for sharing that with us. But, you know, I'm thinking about how overwhelming what you've done seems to me, must seem to to a lot of people to make this kind of difference. And and you did, throughout your talk, you sort of talked about how some things built on each other. But can you just talk about how small did this start? I mean, I, I because I think that's probably important, right, that people should should realize that it's something really small can lead to something very big, right? But I, I'm just wondering, what was your initial goal that became all of this? Well, you know, I'll say I really learned to listen to the community. I had a lot of ideas, and I'm glad I changed my way and just started to listen, right? You just have to start with one thing at a time, but you have to listen to the community because we do not have the same perspective. My ideas for what they, you know, need are probably not what they need. Um, and so, you know, when they asked for computers, I could have said, no, there's no electricity out there. We can't do that. Right. But you have to be open minded. Um, and try one thing at a time. And I have had the luxury of getting to pick what I talk to you about. We've had plenty of stuff that didn't work out, right? I mean, I assume you would assume that, but um, I got to choose what I told you about, but you just don't give up. You keep going and you do one thing at a time. And again, we are a community college, right? We don't have a lot of resources. I can't even teach the class right now um, but there's always a way. You just have to do the best you can with what you have. Where's my list? We, where are we on time? One more question? Mm -hmm. Any other burning questions? Oh, oh, oh. Me too. <laughs> I don't want to have to start. Yeah, definitely really inspirational talk. Thank you so much for that. Um, I really thought it was interesting how you have kind of these comparisons that you made from these are the values that I learned in basic science training and this is how I translated it to creating this like amazing organization in class and I'm just curious if you have any advice for people like as they're transitioning from getting a PhD training or training in a similar basic science and how do we make this transition to like having more of an impact on public health yeah, that's a great that's a great question. And you know, I think it's it's really knowing yourself and listening to yourself and where you are in your life. That community college job, which I got because I had a PhD, right? That that made me marketable for that job. That job allowed me to put my kids on the bus in the morning and get them off at the end of the day. That job allowed me to do some projects like this, right? So I would say be flexible, be open-minded, you know, think about where you are in your life. Wherever you are, there's something you can do. There's so much need even within a community, right, where you live. Um, even just doing some volunteer work, that's where you really learn something about yourself and you'll sort of develop your passions for it. And of course I'm biased, but I think training in basic research like that really gives you the skills 
to tackle tough problems, right? Because there's a lot of unknowns in research. And don't we know we kind of learn more from our failures <laughs> from than the successes a lot of times when it comes to research. And so keep an open mind, stay flexible, and just be uniquely you. You know, you don't have to fit a certain mold. What a fantastic way to end our talk. Please. Join me in congratulating Dr. Musa on her award. Thank you all for coming out. We're here all week. There's something special every single day. So I hope to see you at some of our other events this week. Please go grab a bite to eat. Uh, would you mind taking a few questions? So if, if you so if you have questions, please see. Anyway, wonderful, wonderful. Oh, I really enjoyed talking to you. I'll, I'll figure out a way.